it's on. Okay, we're good? Yeah, we are recording for right. California law. Right. I'm disclosing. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, but yeah, like what you said about the, there's something in what you said that reminds me of like this weird collective psychology that teams seem to have about like their performance and their doubt. Yeah. So there's, there's always this moment of, Hey, we're doing really great. And then the fan culture inside the club will, will there'll be the cynics and the skeptics who say, actually you need to keep in mind like statistically we have like 95 percent of the season to play you know this is how we fared last time and so there's this weird like pull between like i guess like finesse and geometry that's what i was gonna i was just gonna say that right now we have all these this terminology but yeah so and i remember uh i guess that was a few years ago right when lester went on their run and they won yeah. And, and it was crazy. And everyone the entire season is saying, oh, they can't keep it up. It's not going to last. You know, they're on a hot streak. And the naysayers, like all the way up until like two weeks before, like until they had it mathematically clinched, mm-hmm. everyone was just saying, oh, no, City's going to catch them. They're going to fall off. Like everyone just – and so – but within, so that's even like one step beyond, right? Because it's so, when you get a phenomenon like that, then you have the the coverage is also looking at it and saying, come on guys, like, and they're using, they're using all spirit of geometry, right? right? And then even, and even the fans are, they're wanting to believe, but then also not wanting to. <laughs> and you see it, I remember there was a clip of this guy, he was like, a hundred years old or something went to the last game, like when they, when they finally won it and he was crying. And it's, I think it's that, that relief where you didn't want to, be, you, you want to believe, but you don't go fully because yeah. you're scared of, of being let down. And so you just kind of hold your breath, hold your breath, hold your breath. And then it happens and it's like, okay. Right. We, and when we it made it, and when it, I think when it happens as well, it's this, it, it, it can, like, if it didn't happen, you would tell yourself that, like, you know, I was prepared for this. But when it happens, it, the prophecy fulfills and everything, yes. it's like, oh, I, I did believe. And it makes yeah. sense now. I'm like, so that's so paradoxical to me. But, the, but, I, but I love that I think you, you don't get that that tension that the, the, that builds and builds and builds unless you, because you're, you believe it's not like, you know, if we're gonna, if we had like a slider, we'd say, Oh, you're at this point. It's not really like that. Right. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's more of a, it's more of like a time series where you're going and you're like, okay, I believe. And then your belief kind of falls off a little bit. Right. And then, you know, you have a bad game, but then, they pull it out at the end. So then now you're like, oh, yes, okay, I believe fully. Right. And, and so that battle between, yes, we're going to do it and feeling like it's all going to fall apart is what then gives you that payoff at the end. Right. Where it's like you don't get the release without all of that uh, oh. tension and pressure build up. Oh, you know, and – so it's it's like a momentum almost because I you know it's like an oscillation around it around a, around the, the point of view. yes Perhaps. yes yes your truth is unwavering but your relationship to it yeah it's like a spiraling around it or a oscillation and that yeah that that absolutely chimes in with my experiences with um, with faith and doubt in general actually not not just in sports but yeah that's for another time <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> but the, um, the, the role of doubt is really interesting to me because you're saying that like there's such a commitment to doubt from all the other clubs when we when you, when you see Leicester like trying to trying to do it and like it's kind of a I don't I don't know if it's a radical thing or not but when there's you know someone say someone from Coventry City would say like I want to see Leicester do it that's to me that's like 
all right, you're putting aside your team colors and your tribalism in order to um, try and promote this opportunity for transcendence. Yeah. And that's just beautiful. Like, And I think you see that in sports occasionally. I don't think we see it as often because of, because of the professional element and what's at stake. So like you add the financial element, you add the, the fame, everything else. It's like no one... No one's willing to be that sportsman like all the time because the cost is, is pretty high. But when you do see that moment of humanity and like say a tennis match where it's really heated, but then there's like this this sportsmanship, this meeting of two people's humanity instead of them as adversaries. It's just right. it's just a tremendously beautiful moment in the, that that I think people see and they they get this this glimmer in themselves of like, hey, this is this is this all this is all just kind of you know transient, and at the end of the day, we're just people, and, and that's that's um, I love seeing that. I don't think we see it as often as we do, and it also reminds me, of, you know, you were saying the war. There's an analog between sports and war, like the. Do you know the story of World War One in the trenches at Christmas and they right? Oh it's yeah. Like, it's like a weird, like Russian doll of of that. So, like in a tennis match where you've got these two people going out and they're screaming at each other, and then they have this like very cordial. I wouldn't say cordial interaction. It's not cordial. It's it's a human interaction. Mm-hmm. And then, so when you're in the middle of, <laughs> it's funny that you have to like in that instance you give up the sports to be human. But then, because war is so, again, just so abstracted from the human that the only way they could step down from war was to play adversarial sports, man. <laughs> right, right, because they, they actually played matches at different points, you know, between them. And what? so it just reminds me, too, of... Uh, so there was a football coach in the U.S. named Greg Schiano, and he would have his team... Do you know... Are you aware of what I'm talking uh, about? Okay. No, I don't know. So in... When the center would go to snap the ball to the quarterback, right. at the very end of the game, usually they do it and they just take a knee. Well, he had his team try to time it and have someone dive in. So right at the point when the center is going to move the ball, have someone dive in at everyone's knees and try to knock the ball away to get a turnover in the last seconds of a of close game. And – in college, I think it worked a few times because it's college football. Right. But then he got a job in the NFL, and everyone was like, "Is he going to do this?" And the you know these are, this the quarterback there makes fifteen twenty million dollars a year. The whole franchise is built around the quarterback. You've got these linemen who they can just you know get their knee shredded in one second, uh, and so everyone was like, "Is he going to do this? This is not." You can't do this. You can't do this. And he did it. And players would get so upset about the fact that he would do this. Why? And, what was the rationale? So I think it's the loss of that human element because you're, you're sacrificing your humanity for the game. Right. And so once you do that, then you lose the sport, loses its transcendent potential okay. when you do that. See, that, that, uh, that's what I want to talk about was the, the, the difference between winning and particip- participation. Yeah. And going back to the Lester thing, it's like the, especially in America, the, but I think everywhere, the underdog story is, right. is what will get people to shed their, shed their tribal colors and, and root for someone else that may not be, you know, and the, but one of the other things, and Peterson talks about this, is he talks about gymnastics, but I think about it more for um, ice skating in the Olympics mm-hmm. because I don't know anything about ice skating. <laughs> but I do know that when they have, you know, you have four years and these people dedicate their entire life to this like three minute routine once every four years, right? right. And they're standing on a little, you know, butter knife 
on ice twirling in circles and I have no idea what's going on. But when they say, oh, this guy, he won the world championship the last three years, right? Now he's got to be, he's going for the gold medal. And he, you only really get one shot in your prime <laughs> at it, at a sport like that. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, here you go. You, you've worked for the last, you know, since you were four years old. So you've worked for 14 to 18 years for this moment right here yeah and then everyone is watching and everyone and it's like the some of all of the competitors are hoping that you mess up mm -hmm. but then as just an outsider like i love seeing them have to navigate that pressure situation right and, and seeing them like have to go through everything and knowing that at any second they could slip and it's just like done and then when yeah. they do it, it's like, I find that to be so incredible. And, and it's, it's more than the, you don't have the same uh, back and forth in, as in a lot of other sports. Right. It's because just, it's so isolating that it, it, it almost, it, it's a different dynamic than right. like a team sport. This is interesting because I was trying to get to this with my difference between like soccer or NFL and then that being like a nationalist kind of analog, you know, you, you all wear the colors, you sing the same songs, you face the same direction. Yeah. And you hate the people who wear the other colors, right? They're, they're scumbags. Right? Mm -hmm. So that I, that I found that interesting. And then I was thinking UFC because UFC is like, it's just you and then the snake, but the snake is just, it is exactly the same size and weight you are, exactly the same weight you are basically. So, that's that's an interesting one but again it's very there's adversary there's an adversarial element to that which is which again is i i find it you know i think a lot of people think the ufc is kind of akin to roman blood sports but i don't think so something in the struggle that just i love in that well about ufc one of the things that i noticed um early on with ufc and and no so People talk about it, yeah, it, it, it has that very, uh, when you see it, right, it makes that, there's that something in your, deep down in your lizard brain, you're like, ooh, this is, this that's, is primitive. It feels that's, primitive. That's how it gets me going, though. But Yes, exactly. But it, but it also, it, it resonates on a primitive level also. Yeah. And, and some people can't, can't handle that, I think. Yeah. Uh, but the actuality of it is, is that boxing is far more like a couple guys died earlier this year. No way. In boxing. Wow. Because you, in UFC, it, it has that, that impact where you're like, oh man, he's, but then they stop the fight, right? Because there's no gloves and they're not, so they're not taking these repeated blows. But at the same time, what I've come to realize when they started the women's UFC, mm -hmm. I watched the, the Ultimate Fighter show. I watched the season they did with the women. And they are technically very skilled, but they don't have, it doesn't have the same danger as the men's fight, where they can make mistakes that men cannot make because the other person doesn't, they, a lot of times it's just they don't have enough weight to generate the power or to get the right amount of pressure on their, on their jujitsu holds. And so they can't finish the fight. Whereas in the men's like, and that's why even the quote unquote boring fights, it's only boring because you're waiting for that one moment where somebody gets destroyed. Yeah. In aha, where it's, it's in the struggle, like mm -hmm. it's not in the result. And the reason, and the reason that there's such tension there is because one mistake will get you flattened like right. instantly because they're looking for that one spot where then whether it's to take you down or to land right and then you have all these different um martial arts where you don't know which one they're going to use at any given time and you you plan and you know whose specialty is what but yeah. that adds a whole nother element of of the unknown into it that's interesting. 
I've got two, two things on that. There's the Daniel Cormier, Stipe Miocic fight, too, the second one. And then on the, just, just to finish the analogy we had with the gym. So gym, if we take gymnasts, UFC, and then soccer, like that, like, so you've got team versus team, then you've got just you, you individuals. And then you've got with gymnasts, it's like the snake is in you, right? So it's the doubt. It's like that. <laughs> that's the thing you've really got to wrestle with there. Yeah. That's, I think I should start checking some gymnastics and like ice skating out because I was, I was thinking that was like how, what's like the ultimate challenge barrier to overcome. And I think if it's your own sense of doubt, um, and you're only relying on your performance and no, you know, you don't, you can't outsource it to a team, then that's interesting. Um, and then with the Daniel Cormier, Stephen Miocic thing, it was, I caught bits of it, but it was almost as, as, as if, Cormier's insistence on beating Stipe at his own game lost him the lost him the fight, which is yeah, it's, this that was interesting to me that in that the this this desire to be the best made made sure that he wasn't. <laughs> he never got that title because he was he was trying to win a different game, I think. Mm -hmm. in, a lot, instead of like playing the geometric game that I don't know, there's a, there's, he could have played it safe, but maybe not. Well, that's also like when teams will, they'll be so focused on what the other team is going to do that they don't focus on what they need to do. And right. so rather than being proactive, yeah. they're, they're so, they're trying to react and predict all these different possibilities instead of just being the one who dictates the action right and and that that really uh happens a lot tactically uh in soccer i i, I think it the most in soccer because it's so fluid that you're having to decide okay what are what what's our strategy what's our overall strategy that we're trying to accomplish tactically and if your strategy is we're going to react to what they're going to do, then you're already putting yourself on the back foot. So what you're saying here is that Trump is definitely going to win 2020. Well, I don't, I don't know about that, but. Wow. It sounds like it, you know, it seems that I don't know if the Republicans are in the same camp or not. I'm just, it was just an offhand comment, but the, like the, it seems that the, the certain political parties are more interested in doing that than actually like, instead of like, you know, what are we about? What are we representing? What are our values? Like, how do we connect with like our voter base? How do we, how do we embody a spirit of finesse in, a, in, in how we operate? They're like, how do we, how do we get that guy out of the White House? Or like, how do we, uh, how do we make sure that the, those people don't win? You know? And that's, that's what I'm seeing played out. Like, here's the thing though, in the, the, reactive strategy yeah fails when your opponent doesn't make mistakes right and that's or or when they do then because you only practiced the reaction you you don't know how to how to switch gears and and then capitalize so the same thing like in the UFC that we're talking about right where if you you can recognize the mistake and then you can you can start to do it, but you can't finish yeah. because you didn't practice that well enough. So it's almost as if you need like the spirit of geometry to see the mistakes as they come up and be primed for them to happen. But then you need to employ the finesse, the tiger-like finesse, in order to to know when to switch. Yeah, to pounce, to to, to capitalize, and to just destroy. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh yeah, it's really interesting actually. I think it's it's like a spirit of geometry is like practice, right? You you get the, you're getting the the repetition, the muscle memory, so that you're not you're not thinking about what you need to do during the action. Yeah. Instead, you're using the spirit of finesse to decide when do I need to do. I have all these different scripts that I can yeah. run at any given time, and and but. The, the real key is when do I run it? And that's, right. and that's where if you, if you focus so much on 
you know, geometry and, and all your situations, but then you don't know when to apply the situations, then it doesn't do you any good. Uh, and yeah, that's definitely something I, I understood <laughs> recently. <laughs> the, um, the, um, it reminds me of GSP, you know, in UFC. Um, the, the thing they say about him is that when he, he didn't use any, it's almost like there were no repetitions in the, um, in the creativity he was using. He wouldn't, he, there were no like cheap, dirty go-tos he would use. He would use, he'd pull something different out of the bag each time. And not only is that like a sense of you having this arsenal of, of things you can readily employ to, to respond creatively to whatever you're facing, but then there's this sense of like, the other person has no idea what's going on. Right. They're just like, okay, I, I'm, I'm just going to crawl up and <laughs> right. let you do your thing here because as I'm not going to be able to, to overcome that. Um, it's like the epitome. It's like the ultimate level of finesse where he, he's just going to do something and you're going to be the one. So it's a, it's a, it's a very, even though it's a finesse, you know, perspective on it, it's a very proactive level of finesse because you're so good at it that you're just going to throw at someone else and they're they're relying on geometry to be able to say to look at their opponents and say okay he likes to do this he uses this combination in these situations so i'll i'll do this right and they're trying to play this very um almost like a complicated versus complex Right. They're trying to play a complicated game yeah. and he's playing a complex game where he's going in and it's whatever, what I do is going to depend on what you do, which depends on what I do, which depends on what you like. And right. he's just going to sort of just keep building and building on top of whatever he sees. It's, it's interesting because it's like an inversion of like, say if you, if we're having a conversation right now, like I should be focusing like entirely on you basically. Like, in, like, embodying this other sentiveness in order to, to, to bridge this gap. But when it's an adversarial thing, it's like it all needs to be from within. So there's this sense of like, yeah, if I pay too much attention to, or maybe it's the same, it's the quality of it, maybe the quality of attention you pay to what the other person's doing. Well, I, I mean, just to relate it to what you just said, I find that in an adversarial, like a debate style. You're only listening for the, the gaps or the holes that you can poke. Yeah. Instead of if you're listening in order to try to enhance whatever the person is saying. Right. And so you, you get that reciprocity. Whereas in a debate, you're just looking to score points. And so you don't, you don't build anything through a debate, which is why I find most of the, you know, YouTube debate things very uninteresting because it, I'd rather watch those people individually present their ideas and then yeah. do the debate in my head. Yeah. Well, that, that was what was interesting with Peterson and Zizek was that, Pearson went into it like with this very, you know. Geometric. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. And then Zizek just started spitting straight bars, man. And I was like, this guy's waxing poetic, lyrical over here. Like it was, it was, it, it was jarring because I was like, you know, I was expecting a bit, bit more of a, a spectacle than that. But then at the same time was like, okay, this is actually, probably more interesting um so yeah that was my surprise um the other thing i was thinking about when we were uh yesterday when we we're talking about sports and war was the the all blacks in rugby yeah the, their the their dance the uh, yeah yeah that's uh, terrifying and it's fear, right? And I, I remember when I was a kid, I'd watch these uh, war movies. And, you know, like 
mostly medieval era, you know, Braveheart, whatever. And whenever they do an ambush, they, when they are coming out to ambush the other troops, they would yell. And in my head, I would be like, well, aren't you trying to surprise them? Right? Like, why are you, why are you yelling if you're trying to surprise them? That's the whole point of an ambush. Right. Then as I've, you know, gotten older, then I come to realize the, the power of the ambush is not the surprise. It's the fear that you generate and the, the yell is to get the fear because you get them. Once you get the fear, then that's how you get the route. And that's, that's how, and then you, you get them to turn and run and that's when the slaughter happens. And so the, the, in uh, World War One, the Germans, they switched their uniforms to be that, that gray and they right. would, they would blend in with the fog. Right. And then also in, uh, and it was terrifying yeah, it's great. because they would all, you would hit in, instead of a, a war cry, it was the artillery was the war cry. The drum roll. Mm-hmm. The drum fire. And then in the civil war, the South, they had, I mean, it was brown and gray. There was a lot of mix because they didn't have all the, the manufacturing to do it. But the standard color that you'll see, their official color of like the Lee's army, they wore the gray. Mm-hmm. And they would do the same thing. They would march through the mist and come out. And because of the way they fought back then, they'd be all of a sudden you'd be just standing there in a line and then they come out of the fog and they're right on top of you, ready to go. Um, like, have you seen the movie Glory? No. There's, okay, there's a scene in that, that that pretty well depicts this idea of just this endless line of soldiers emerging out of the fog. And, and it's like, you know, it's time to fight. And that, and so the South, they had the rebel yell and it would make this, this really weird kind of um, banshee sound. Right. You can't see it, right? All you do, you hear it. And then it's just getting closer and closer and closer. And then all of a sudden they break through and it's, you know, that is, it's like psychological warfare. Really. Absolutely. And the, yeah. uh, I think it was the, the picks. Yeah. They would, they, they were famous for having those crazy female warriors and, they would have these these yells and stuff, and it just like the Vikings did the same thing. So you have all all of these different examples throughout history where the that intimidation factor is such a huge part of their their actual fighting strategy. Right. It's um, the one thing I've mentioned several times recently that I've just been fascinated about that speaks directly to that is Mike Tyson's um, entrance. Strategy. Yeah, I, w- I wanted to hear more about this. Just, yeah, he, uh, you know, I watched a little clip on YouTube about this and he would win fights just before he even stepped into the ring because he would work himself up into a sweat before he came out and he was like, he would be punched in walls sometimes but like really just getting like unnecessarily angry and wouldn't wouldn't respond to much uh, before fights and then he would go out without a robe already swaying there's no ceremonious like i'm wearing a gold robe like this right you know, not indicating that you're a you're anything but an animal and uh, i'm here to hurt you yeah yeah i'm here to hurt you i'm gonna look right in your eyes when i get in the ring i'm not gonna change a thing about my face and the, the, the music that he would play this is because obviously I, I love i love music and the effect it has on me when i when i exercise and that's fascinating to me, but the, the thing he would play was just a single note, like a o- ominous drone, let's say. And it would, yeah, just terrify these guys. You can see clips of these guys who are like big dudes. I can't remember the, some of the, you know, the, the specific fights, the names of the fellas he went up against, but they would just start, you can tell, like, it's like, uh, they they can't look at him properly. They like, look glance on the floor, like, uh, like getting getting nervous. And yeah, that was that's just uh, 
that's incredible to me that you can win a fight before you've even thrown a punch. And yes, yeah, I guess it's the same with, with warfare, right? It's the um, it's Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu's art of war is all about coercion and and whatnot. And, um, well, and it's because in sports, right, you're you're constrained. You can't pick the terrain like in war. Right. You don't, you don't, everyone know, you, there's no surprise in, in terms of you can't ambush anybody, right. right? Because everyone, you have the field and you have the time and you have, everyone's equal on all these levels. But the one place you can, you can be better in skill. You can be better in cooperation, which is, those are skills too. Right. But then you can also, you have the psychological aspect. And that's where you can gain a huge edge over people uh, where if you, if you come in and you know, but it also, it, it's, it has that weird, almost human paradoxical element where if you have too much skill and then you don't have sufficient psychological skills, mm -hmm. then you get cocky. And then someone can beat you. So it has this, this tipping point yeah. where, where then the other team can look at it and then they can, you can have a team who is not as gifted but is stronger mentally than can grind out results and, and do things that other teams who might have a, a greater expectation of their abilities – then they get frustrated when it doesn't work and, right. and, and then they don't have that mental strength and then they start, they start fighting within each other and, and, and then it falls apart. Right. Right. It's a very, it doesn't, it's a the ranks. yeah. And, and it's a weird, you would, where you look at it on paper and you would say, well, they, they are clearly going to win. Right. But then right. you got to go play the game because there, there's that, the, that human that human element to it and that's okay so are you familiar with esports at all yeah. yeah i used to i used to when i played more video games i can't anymore because it's a bit of an addiction for me um i still play some grand strategy stuff like uh -huh. yeah europa universalis is like like just uh, probably my favorite game okay but the, the one i used to play was overwatch okay okay so that was for me that was like the perfect uh symphony of team cooperation individual skill uh understanding at a deep level the mechanics of each character the terrain like everything psychology like everything just linked up for me so that, that was like the most enjoyable esports experience i've ever had do you think part of the problem with esports is that the viewer doesn't connect with another human. So yeah. it, 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 it makes it so you can't, you can't have casual fans of esports in right. the way that you can have casual fans of football and soccer and basketball uh, because you, even if they just show the person sitting, like it's weird because, okay, so po poker, is that's like a in between between an esport and a r actual sport? Oh, this is yeah. You're giving me a lot to think about here. But, but people watched yeah. the World Series of Poker on ESPN in the millions, and it was. I'm having, I'm having trouble placing that. Then well, I don't know what what that is because esports. I I always thought esports doesn't take off because of just the the kind of aesthetic surrounding the whole video game industry at the moment but to me it's like it's like when you play a video game you're extending like your like a set a part of you that comes from it's like you know when you drive a car like you're using your feet but you're looking at the road right it's that subsidiary focal integration that's happening same thing happens when you play a video game you're kind of you you thought all is ha it's all happening here. But you're just you're just kind of staring at the screen, and, and right. you're, you're in that world, but you're operating like from here. Mm -hmm. And 
And so I think, I think that the fact that you have to extend yourself into a digital environment means that unless other people are able to, are very versed in the game and able to, they understand the language of the game to the point where they can extend themselves into that environment just by watching it. But they that's how you get fans of esports. But well, I think they also they have to be able to extend themselves in. Or actually, it's actually they have to be able to project backwards out of what they're looking at into their body. Right. Yeah. Right? In the yeah. way that you that yeah, you exactly. with the controller go into the game. Right. They have to be able to go backwards and say, "Okay, I'm watching him." his character move around and do this. Yeah. If I wanted to do that, I would do this. Cause then you have an appreciation right. for how technically gifted the player is. Yes. And it reminds me of like, say if I'm sat with my wife and I'm playing this, you know, this game or whatever, and she's just seeing stuff on the screen and there's no, there's no, there's nothing. She's like, okay, that's fine. And then if I give her the control, I'm like, right, you go and do it. And all of a sudden, this sense of like responsibility and danger is like, I'm going to do something wrong. Or like, what's that thing there that's coming at me now? It's like, okay, so now that you've, now that you've grasped it, finally, like you're getting it. So it's, yeah, it's a, um, yeah, it's a weird one. But yeah, but any any person, right? Just walking, you you have a, you, you see someone running fast on the screen. Yeah, and you're like, oh, okay. I know, I know what that is. You, you, <laughs> it's all built in, yeah, yeah. right? And so it it makes it. I wonder if it is an impossible hurdle for esports that that they they are going to have to resign themselves to being a niche market and just do what they because if they try to broaden out and appeal, but then it fails, and so like the like Blizzard sunk a bunch of money into yeah. various games yeah. to try to do that and it didn't work and I, I know like Overwatch has been I think it's considered like the the flagship like if you want to do an eSport this is this is the standard that's been yeah. set now for it and I just wonder if the whole push for trying to get it on TV and do certain things if that's the wrong model because the people who are going to encounter it there don't have the skill. Right. That's so the, the model is to the, well, let's, let's say a potentially better model would be to somehow invite a, a, a more integrated sense of particip participation rather than just being sat behind another screen. There needs to be, yeah, there needs to be some sort of because because when you think about soccer matches, like the audience really is participating there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're part of the whole energy. They're singing the songs and stuff, and you see that in esports. And it's like they've taken what they what you see. You've taken the format from NFL or whatever you want and transplanted it into this this kind of half digital, half physical world. And it's just it's just not mapping up. So you need to make the audience participation at least half digital half digital too yeah otherwise they can't bridge that gap themselves just by same screen that's yeah that's a thought we should sell this as a, as a <laughs> but i wonder so i did uh i went to arizona yeah ago and for work we did a virtual reality sort of experience thing yeah. and you you're like free you just walk around you so you have the gear and it was like a zombie zombie survival right. shooting game cool. and you so you have all your stuff and you're walking around so you're playing a video game but you have all of the physical connection to the action that's going on right. so i i wonder if video games move towards if if the physical is more incorporated in the yeah. video game that then you could have esports of of like you're not watching you're you're where then instead of it being controlled by a controller you you know that humans are controlling it with their body yeah. then you start to have more of a connection with what's going on well i i was actually thinking that they, what they need to do is 
is um, what well, I thought where you were going with this was you, that's a good point that the my mind started going down a completely different path, which was uh, you know like the environments in which esports happen. So each each level or arena or match or whatever map, I think they call maps, right? So each map is built for the players. So the maps aren't built for a, like if there were stands in the actual maps in the digital game, like they, they, there's no fans sitting in them would be able to see anything. So is there something in being able to invite people to put a headset on and sit in a digital community or stand and watch the game being played out and have some sort of like more participatory interactions happening as well? Like, I think that would make it really compelling for me. I'd probably, you know, if I was really in, interested in watching sports, I'd rather do that and sit in the environment than like, like just watch it on the screen. Well, what if you could be, um, okay, what if you could be, so you're, you're I, I've never played Overwatch, but I've seen it. So I, I know roughly, right, what it is. So what if you could be like a ghost character in the environment? Exactly. And so then if you want to follow around a particular person that, you know, okay, this is my, I really like this character or I really like this player playing this character. I want to watch them. So you could like shadow yeah. somebody around and then you get to see what they see, or you get to see a third person view of, of them and, and doing whatever, depending on the game, right? If it's a hand to hand fighting style like league of legends style game yep. or if you had a a shooter game you probably more want like behind behind the person or just first person but having something like that where then you're yeah you're, you're taking the person the 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 viewer mm -hmm. into the environment so that then they can actually see what's going on now I wonder if that would even, I still question whether esports itself can be for non gamers. I, I just don't. I, don't. I don't think so. I think that if you, the kind of knowing it takes to understand what's to happening. To appreciate. It's, it's embodied. You have to be someone who plays it in order to yeah. see the difference of soccer, where you, know, you don't have to know much about soccer to get the kind of. The ballet element to it, the, the beautiful. So, it's almost like, again, you you remove the human element, right? There's no there's no opportunities for sportsmanship or or those little mm -hmm. um, transcendent moments, right? To come through because it's not it doesn't have the same sort of bestial aspect as the the guys swiping at someone's knees right. but it it still lacks in the same way the human side of being able to connect because you're competing through digital projections right and so the most that can happen is the the actual competitors can like shake hands at the end of the but there's no there's no danger no. Right? you don't have you don't have injuries that's one of the things I think where you see the most human element is is when there's uh, typically really bad injuries. Right? Someone breaks a leg or, yeah. or something. Because then... It's the presence of risk that makes something meaningful sometimes, right? Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and that without that danger, like the, da the, the realization of the shared danger yeah. is what like on Christmas in 1914 generates this spontaneous, um, you know, uh, ceasefire. Yeah. Just out of everyone is just like, what are we doing? Okay. For this one day, we're not going to do it. Right. And it was so, it was so powerful that they had to, they, they, the officers and the, the higher ups, had to coordinate and say, okay, we can't allow this ever again right. to happen because it was so powerful and everyone knew it. Wow. If, if you, if, if every year they did that, 
or the war would be over because people would say, oh, well, what are we doing? I, I've wondered about the, so when, when the Nazis, the Nazis in the Olympics, and it was like, oh, should they be banned from the Olympics? Right. I think it's the wrong move. I, I don't think you ban people from, because then you give, you give them the, the Streisand effect that they, that they want to use. Mm -hmm. right to promote oh look you see i told you we're we're being we're being shunned we're being oppressed by them they don't want to include us but you also deny the people who are ideologically possessed the potential to break out of it through a shared human experience with all these other people right and, and it's like so it, it seems like oh we should punish them but it's actually like you should punish them because they're doing bad things. Yeah. But it's actually the exact that that has the exact opposite effect that you, than the one that you wanted. Right. Whereas if you just said, "Oh yeah, come and compete with us in a civilized forum," yeah, then then they might you might have them realize, "Oh, oh, we we can get along with them and compete in these nonviolent ways." or semi-violent way right but less than all-out warfare and, and so it, it just seems like one of those and even intuitive even selfishly it's like i want to i want to be the nazi guy at like shop but man i want to you what, you guys are eugenicists all right let's see how far that <laughs> let's, let's see how let's see how you take that like, that's when i beat you you're angry. it's um yeah, so there's that element too, which is yeah, like, you can shatter the their their myth, yeah, of their but, superiority, but you need their to, innate superiority. But you need to be very, very gifted in order to do that. That's the that's the that's the trick. You gotta. That's a level of finesse as well that you know doesn't doesn't come easy, I guess. Uh, so um, yeah, that. But the thing you, we're talking about, we say the presence of risk in, in making something meaningful too. It's like. There's like a weird, I don't know. I will, I'll work more on this, but I'm thinking about original sin and how it might relate to that. Oh, interesting. Right. Yeah. We can do that in the video. It's like tightrope, tightrope walkers. Right? They talk right. about it where yeah. they fall all the time when they're practicing. Yeah. Because right. they don't have the risk. Oh, okay. So they just do, if there's a net, you're more likely to fall. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, interesting implications for a lot of things on that, yeah. And so you're just, when you don't, then it's, and that's like, that's why, I mean, if you see it, that, that's, this kind of goes back, I think, to the sport thing, or the esports thing. If you see someone walking on a tightrope, okay, every single person can immediately identify that situation and go, oh man, and you, you're transfixed. You can't look away because, <laughs> because you're just like, this is crazy. Oh my God, is he gonna fall? He's gonna die. Like, yeah, and yeah. everybody know the, the, the attendant risk is so at hand that it captures you. Yeah. Also, every, so everyone observing is thinking that except for the guy walking across it. And he, right. He is because in order to counteract that in sort of equal measure, he has to apply his focus to the, you know, the center of his body and his steps and the wire. And, and, and so it's, it's, but no, I, I no. wonder if nobody was watching him walk, if he would be more likely to fall. Oh, this is interesting to me. So I don't, would you be more likely to fall if no one was watching? That's, oh, that I, I I'm not prepared to answer that question. <laughs> I don't I don't think I can use um, I don't that's think like I can a, use logical reasoning to answer that question. But I have no, no, that's like a Rupert Sheldrake, right? right like type type question where it's like this weird, uh, yeah. share you know shared consciousness that. Yeah. 
yeah exactly it changes it just changes the met- like the metaphysics completely it really does like as, right. soon as, as soon as you add other people into the mix well it transitions it from a complicated to a complex right as you add people into it if you if you have a human element to to the thing even just as ob- observers but if yep. you allow for the the observation effect then it, it completely changes it from it being like just a just a physics problem right okay so is this i mean i've only just started watching the rupert sheldrake lecture yesterday with Lina, but i mean there's like the probability distribution and electrons and the observation effect that do and this is all okay mm-hmm. I'm, I'm i'm terrible with math and physics but i'm gonna i'm gonna give it a go at some point i guess i can see that this might be related but yeah that's um what I, what I, that reminds me of like the, the tightrope walking too is um, the Eastern concept of Wu Wei or not trying. And that, you, yeah, it, I often perform best at running when I'm not, I'm not trying. If I'm not employing a spirit of geometry, I'm, I'm not thinking about like, all right, I need to do this segment faster than I did the last one in order to get the time I want because I want to get a better time. Like it's, what does that, any of that even mean? Like it's, it just, it really, something that really frustrates me about the um, triathlon culture in, in London, in the UK, it's very, it's all finance guys too. It's all the guys who work in finance. Oh, of course. Of right. course yeah. it is. Yeah. So it's, they don't play golf uh, anymore. I don't know why they stopped playing golf, but they went, uh, it's, it's almost like it was a more. It's a reaction back against the golf yeah. <laughs> culture primal element but then they still get to use all the, the fit bit like the data it's all about comparing data and it's all, it's all data driven yeah yeah just it, it winds me up a little bit but yeah the like I, I perform best at running when i'm not focusing on any of that at all and obviously i get a lot out of it if, yeah so i did a fair bit this morning and was like all right i remember it's why the I did flow, flow state yeah right exactly mm-hmm. it's wonderful really wonderful place to be um i think i'm gonna have to shoot because I've got stuff to do today, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, that was that was an absolute pleasure, man. And thank you. Yeah, that was great. Thank I'll, you uh, time. I'm gonna stop the recording now. Great.